Welcome, deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. Hey everybody, this is Bronson. Just a quick note before we get going today. Uh, Today's podcast is not going to be about the rut and it's not going to be about antlers or things like that. But instead, it's going to be on a topic that should be of interest to anybody that owns land or is thinking about purchasing land. And so today we're going to talk about cost share programs uh, and how you can help offset the cost of implementing conservation on your property. So maybe you don't own property, but maybe you know someone that does, if you wouldn't mind sharing this episode with them. Thanks a lot. Welcome back to Deer University. And today we have a topic that I admit I have been very i'm not being shy here i've been very ignorant about over the course of my career and that has been cost share programs government cost share programs and i've kind of been ignorant about it because i've had people like our guest today john grucci has been a guru with these types of programs over the years and so i can always give him a call and ask him what about this program what about that program and he always brings me up to speed. So our guest today is Mr. John Grucci. And and John, when we talked about this podcast a few days ago, I asked you to talk about um, come enlighten everyone about cost share programs. And you corrected me and you called it, um, you would rather talk about offsetting the cost of conservation. You said that's a much more appropriate title. Yeah. So, John, before you get going, why don't you tell everybody where you're from, your background, and what you do nowadays? Well, I appreciate it, Bronson. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Like you said, my name is John John Grushy, and I work for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Uh, I was a private lands biologist for about seven years, and uh, I've been an administrator for about the past four or five years, um, coordinating the statewide private lands program. And uh, it's been kind of a, a pet peeve of mine, I guess, to uh, to go straight to cost share. You know, I guess uh, like the the, straight, the first pitch, um, the first pitch of the game. A lot of people put things in front. Uh, or, or go straight to cost share when there are a couple other things that I'd, I'd like to see us start with when we have that conversation about offsetting the cost of conservation, like I said. Uh, but I did want to get a spoiler out of the way for folks who are not familiar with this. Um, before you, you listen to a podcast, an entire podcast, get all the way to the end and get disappointed, we are not going to tell you how you can get cost share or, or money for planting your food plots or mm. fertilizing them or liming them. Uh, we will also not tell you how you can get free fish to stock your pond, uh, because that's that's very common question. Uh, <laughs> so this, the, back to your, uh, the, this is really sharing and offsetting. This yeah. isn't free. This yeah, is offsetting. Yeah. Not not free at all. Not free at all. What what's very interesting when we talk to and you start talking about funding conservation or or uh, or offsetting the costs, as we say. So uh, conservation is very expensive. It's very important. But there's a cost associated with it, and we've all got to kind of realize that. Not only uh, the landowners, and I'm sure they realize it very clearly, but the the folks who are advocating for conservation, we've got to realize that there's a cost associated with that. So one of the things we do every year, and, and we've done it for a while, we survey our landowners that we work with, and we work with hundreds of landowners each year. And we ask them, you know, did you do any of the conservation practices that I recommended or that we recommended? And if you did, you know, if you did not, why not? Uh, 
and they list kind of a prioritized list of why they weren't able to complete conservation practices. And believe it or not, uh, not having funding is not the number one issue. That's not the number one thing that keeps people from uh, from engaging in active conservation. The number one reason, almost every time we've asked this question, the number one or the highest uh, priority answer, is that people just simply didn't have enough time. And you hear the uh, the old adage, everybody's heard the saying, time is money, right? But t- that's not true at all. Uh, time is not money because you can make more money. You can't make more time. And so... If you think about that in terms of cost share and in terms of conservation and prioritization and all, what you really come down to is we just need to avoid at all costs wasting time. We need to avoid wasting money. We need to avoid doing any types of management practices that aren't going to ma- maximize and advance our overall goal. Let me clarify something with you, John. When um, Based on the, the people you surveyed, you, I and mean, I know you're generalizing here, they're not limited by money a, as much. Not as much as time. As time, okay. Yeah. If you're not limited by money, can't you buy time? Not for yourself, but can't you buy someone to do whatever management needs to be done? It takes time to scope that person out and to, uh, and to, manage that process there's a time investment there so it's not free of time Mm -hmm. you can't simply buy that time back and again i go back to if you can save time if you can cut time out of the equation by not wasting it not uh not wasting money i think that's that's pretty important okay so given that background what's what's kind of your recommendations in terms of success stories and unsuccessful stories yeah, what yeah. what have been the things that you've seen where people have learned to to maximize time and money yeah sure so before we get to talking about cost share before we get to talking about time and money the number one most important thing when we're working on any type of land but particularly uh, on private land is that we have to talk about goals and objectives and outcomes uh, what do you want out of this property? What's your goal of ownership for this property? And a lot of times people will confuse that and they'll say, well, I want to grow, I want to shoot a big deer on this property. And that's not really a goal. That's an outcome. That's an outcome of management. Your goal is to grow older age class deer to increase the opportunity that you might harvest a large yeah. antler buck. Increase the probability yeah, of growing one and harvesting one. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So you have to break those desired outcomes comes out into very specific goals and then those goals will ultimately give you your objectives and you can break those things down as well and a lot of people like to put these types of information this types of information into a management plan Uh, i'm a big fan of management plans but i don't think it has to be a formal management plan to aid you uh, in the process of meeting goals and objectives i think it can be vague and i think you can as long as you have something written down or something clearly stated Um, I've worked with plenty of landowners that don't have a written management plan or don't follow uh, the management plan that was written, but because they have the big picture in mind, they know exactly what they want. They've been able to be uh, successful. So in terms of prioritizing goals, uh, one of the biologists that I work with, William McKinley, you know William. uh, Oh, very well. (laughs) Very well. William, when he works with landowners, he has kind of a standard approach when he talks about goals and objectives. He always tells them, uh, if I gave you 10 poker chips and uh, and you had cups for every one of your goals you list, uh, how would you distribute the poker chips across these cups? And I think that's a good example because when I ask people to put them in order of priority, one, two, or three, you know, and I don't ever let them get past about four or five goals, uh, really, I, really, you could make the case that three is too many. But uh, when you ask people to just put them in sequential order, that doesn't tell you very much. Um, if I know that somebody's goal is large antler deer and it is head and shoulders, you know, nine poker chips to one above income or revenue, that's totally different than somebody that would evenly distribute uh, revenue and, and a large antlered animal. So you've got to kind of think of it from that, that scenario. One, two, and three, but then how much more, how much less? And that really helps you troubleshoot as a biologist right. as well because – if someone just sequentially says deer, turkey, bobwhites, um, 
but they allocated eight chips into deer and yeah. wanted to, you know, you've got some complications there. That's right. You and know. Then, then when we get to doing that, we always find conflicting goals and oh, objectives. Yeah. I'll have, yeah. uh, and then there's unstated goals and objectives. Landowners will, sometimes I see people leave out, uh, for instance, aesthetics. Nobody ever puts aesthetics into one of their top three. But when we start talking about cutting timber and, uh, undergoing early succession management for instance people say well that that just looks awful i can't have that on my property and and they did they failed to tell you that aesthetics was a high priority goal for them um i tell them to get over the aesthetic (laughs) i tell them to start looking at a um a patch of blackberry a patch of rubus sure that to some people might look uh unkempt and you know you've let the weeds get away from you is you kind of have to change what you think pretty is that's oftentimes right. that's right that's right you gotta you've got to uh but that's make, just my two cents with it. Yep. yeah for sure so uh the next thing when we get to the goals and objectives lined out we really have to figure out where does revenue fit into that process so you have to decide uh, and revenue is always going to fit in somewhere people will tell you money doesn't matter well okay i understand that but uh Money, a lot of times, is our vehicle for management. In other words, the merchantability of timber, for instance, can determine our options in terms of management. So we have, revenue generally is going to fit somewhere into that list of priorities, or, or finances is going to fit somewhere into that list. And so uh, depending on where revenue fits, we really have to decide, and, and it helps me a lot to talk with the landowner and determine whether or not the property we're managing is an investment that will ever be sold and thus capitalized upon, or is this a legacy tract? Is this a tract that has been in the family for years? It's a tract that is dear to you for some reason that you would never sell it. It would never be capitalized upon, ideally, and it's got to be preserved for posterity you're going to have this tract in your family forever and so that that changes for me as a biologist we've got to start looking at uh, management whether the management is going to involve capital improvements or a lot of expenses if it's going to be capital improvements and people associate that uh, you know the first thing that comes to people's mind i think are structures uh like you know lodge and all that sure that's a capital improvement uh but also roads and ponds are a big deal a lot of times and when i've got a new landowner if they've got an investment property i tell them you know roads and ponds are like kitchens and bathrooms when you're renovating a house you're going to get that back on the back side if you ever sell that property but it's not something you're ever going to get cost share for you're not going to get any kind of assistance for it but there's a value associated with it that you you know while you own the property you might you might be able to uh, utilize that those those capital improvements and certainly you have to have roads and infrastructure and I, you could do a whole separate podcast just on oh, roads yeah. and infrastructure yeah you got to have roads uh, but you've got to decide how are you going to pay for that and 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 particularly those capital improvements if you're never going to capitalize on that if it's a legacy property it's going to be a lot harder for you to to make some of those decisions and then also expenses so if i have a, a property that's an investment maybe it's not such a big deal for me to uh, put a lot of expenses or, or set up a lot of management that is expensive. But if it's a property that's got to pay for itself, we want to watch that uh, expense uh, index. And so if you look, uh, you know, if you've got a house that you've got to pay rent on and, and you know you have a, for instance, you're a, uh, someone that has uh, a controlled income or a, a fixed income, you don't want to uh, go in and, and, and put in a new central heat and air unit on a 3,000 square foot house. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? You need to kind of have some smaller, less, less monthly expenses. Yeah. So yeah. those are all important. And then estate planning comes into that as well. The other things we look at is, does the property have revenue potential? Is there some way that we can manage the timber for revenue? Is there an agricultural lease associated with it? And does that revenue potential conflict with wildlife management goals? For example, if you've got cattle production going on on the farm, or if you've got forestry uh, forestry practices that are going to be uh, conducted that might conflict with wildlife management, your wildlife management of goals. We've got to talk about that on the front end. Now, some folks would say their revenue potential is going to be wildlife services, and in that case, maybe that changes decision making. But those are all discussions that's got to be had on the front end before we start talking about management recommendations or certainly cost share. This so, sounds real similar to like when you meet with a, uh, when you finally get old enough and you realize someday I do want to retire. And, and you have that meeting with a financial planner. 
and they ask you a lot more information and complicated questions you probably, unless you're in finance, had ever thought of. Yeah. And it's kind of like a cataloging of all this. It's, you know, what are your objectives? When do you want to retire? How much do you want to retire with? You know, it's all this inputs, outputs, and where you want to be. It sounds real similar in a way. Sure, and and I never thought when I got started doing all this stuff that it would be, that it would turn into that. Yeah. But it. But it has to, you know, you know it's yeah. very much got to. All this uh, conservation stuff is expensive, and if we overlook that as people who make recommendations, we're not going to be successful. The other thing we start to look at from time to time is what type of landowner uh, or, or what is the, the financial situation of the landowner. So if I have a wealthy landowner that has low income, for instance, someone who is, uh, who's worked their whole life and retired, but they don't have a lot of revenue coming in, I might uh, have different recommendations for that landowner than perhaps somebody who is a high income earner, somebody who perhaps could do better with some tax relief uh, or a low income earner, <laughs> uh, you know, somebody that really is going to need cost share to help offset some of the costs of big management. And we've got to keep all that stuff in mind. So if you bring all that together and think about big ticket items like balancing goals and cost and then also the sustainability of the management, a couple of points that always come out for me, Bronson, and we talked about some of this ahead of time. Basically, uh, intensive management regimes are going to be best for what you might call investment properties. So if you're going to set up a very intensive management regime on a property, if you want, for instance, and I love Bob White Management. I know this is the deer podcast. Keep it to I, a minimum. Keep it to a minimum. But okay. for example. You'll you let yeah. it slide. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can have an example. But using a Bob White example, I love Bob White Management, but intensive Bob White Management is very expensive. It's very time-consuming. Um, and and has varying levels of success, but uh, you would never want to do that on a legacy property that you couldn't capitalize on your investment at some point. Um, at some point, make sure everybody knows when you say legacy property, you mean yeah. that's going to stay in the family. A, a property that's going to stay in the family. So if you set a property up on a management regime that is very expensive, there is a there is a, a possibility that your your descendants will not want to continue that management regime. Yeah, uh, and you have to think about that on the front end. What's going to happen to this place in the next generation? And 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 really, you've got to think two generations ahead. Uh, a lot of people think about it from a tax standpoint, but you've got to think about it from a, a work standpoint. Three generations ago, my family were all farmers, and now we all live in town, and we can't even farm on the side. I don't have time to do that. So. Mm-hmm. Um, those are things you've got to think. I mean, three genera- what's going to happen three more generations from now? And those have to be in the back of your mind, if not the front. Another example to bring it to a deer example, Bronson, and you have to forgive me for this one, but, uh, you know, high fencing a property. I go on to uh, – I don't, I don't work inside many fences, but you've got to think about the, the uh, liability of setting up that infrastructure. We don't currently have a very good means for – unfencing an area for decommissioning a fence right and so once you put that fence up you're basically assuming it's going to be up for perpetuity yeah that's three a generations. real big commitment exactly yeah. three generations from now how is that fence going to be funded how is the maintenance of that fence going to be funded what's going to happen when trees fall on it what's going to happen when uh you know Properties change hands, economies change, all that kind of thing. Flooding, tornadoes, and it just exactly, goes on and exactly. on. And so, you know, you've got to keep all these things not only on the front of your mind, mm-hmm. uh, not only on the back of your mind, but the front of your mind as well. Uh, also, if, you, if you're if you a landowner that's got a high priority on posterity, if you want to make sure a property is going to stay in your family for a long time, in addition to looking at estate planning, you've got to look at long-term revenue potential. So, you know, where is this property? How is it going to pay for itself How's it going to pay the property taxes particularly? Uh, Also, if you've got a high tax burden, you may want to look for tax relief over cost share. I kind of talked about that already. And cost share is helpful in my mind when I start thinking about cost share, when I'm really looking for cost share for a landowner. It's when we've got a new practice or a high priority practice, a practice that they absolutely can't get away from. For instance, we've got a big erosion issue, a very expensive uh, erosion issue that's got to be taken care of right away. We want to try to find cost share to address that natural resource concern. If you set a property up, uh, for instance, on a fire regime, and you don't have a way to perpetuate that fire regime in the absence of cost share, that's a big consideration. We've got to have a way to utilize uh, 
uh, the management regime that we have, it's got to be have a way to either fund itself or something you can do on your own in the absence of a cost share. Okay, John, we got a little bit of the, the background and philosophy, you know, the things that you're looking for, the things you want to make sure the, the landowner is aware of. Let's go with the starting point now of um, where does someone go to learn, get information, get Man, the ball that, rolling? That's a very good question, Bronson, very good question. So uh, historically, if you start to look at landowner outreach and landowner cost share programs, there's kind of an interesting history there. Um, and it kind of gets overlooked, but basically state fish and game agencies were some of the first ones to get involved in this uh, with the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act. And so really, uh, roughly in the 60s and 70s, we had state fish and game agencies um, that began to provide private landowner assistance. And you're aware, I guess, of our DMAP program that came out of that mm-hmm. grant. Um, and, you know, that was in the, roughly the mid-80s. But you start to move forward from there, and we had some different uh, organizations getting involved. We had the USDA Forest Service had the stewardship program, which was very influential. Uh, And we also had some interesting commodities programs provided by USDA before uh, what most people think of kind of the the when what most folks go to right away when you start talking about cost share we start to talk about the farm bill yeah and a lot of folks forget that's actually was intended or a, a big part of the conservation title well it didn't have a conservation title initially but a big part of it was intended as a commodity regulation program and a soil conservation program um, and i'm talking about specifically the farm bill the uh, and that's the food securities act Um, They have one about every five years you have a farm bill, and it's primarily done by the Agricultural Committee in the U.S. Congress uh, who has to to, uh, address those issues. So the primary organization that manages a lot of the farm bill programs are going to be really the USDA, and there's two divisions, the Farm Service Agency and the Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS. And folks who are interested in those programs can go to that county office. Every county in Mississippi, save for just a few, has a a county office where there is a Farm Service Agency representative or representatives and Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, representative or multiple representatives. Uh, But before you go in, I would recommend that you talk to several different groups. And I always tell people it's a good idea to kind of build your technical guidance team, as I would call it. And technical guidance just means maybe a group of advisors. And so you mentioned earlier your financial planner uh, when you go to to get ready for retirement. You have your financial planner, but you also have your CPA. And you might have an investment broker. You have a whole team of folks uh, that are helping you prepare for retirement. You could look at managing a property for wildlife in a similar fashion. There are a whole lot of technical people out there uh, who are already employed by government and and non-government agencies with the primary job just to help you uh, help make decisions in managing your property. So uh, some key members of that team might be your state agency private lands biologist, and in this case it would be the MDWF&P private lands program. Also, your county cooperative extension service uh, representative, and in this case, you know, most counties have a county agent or Mm -hmm. extension director, I believe is what we call them in Mississippi. The Forestry Commission, you have a county forester in almost every county, and so the Mississippi Forestry Commission would be a good member of that team. And then lastly, we've already talked about USDA, and the, the primary contact is going to be called your district conservationist for NRCS. So moving on into cost share assistance, I guess we talked a lot about the history of the Farm Bill. And if you start to talk more about programs, it really gets tough. Um, We had a guy that worked for us a while back, and I started talking about programs one time. And I went and rattled off a bunch of TLAs, Bronson. Those are are three-letter acronyms I could tell you were getting concerned (laughs) and uh, he he told me i sounded like r2d2 um but uh the the tlas can get a little confusing i actually sent a uh a a new employee to kind of a boot camp scenario a couple of weeks ago and he told me spent all day listening to all these acronyms about farm bill programs and when he got back to the hotel at the end of the night he saw a big sign that said spa 
And uh, he had to stand there and think for a minute. Well, what's the SPA? What's it? Oh, the spa, the spa <laughs> at the hotel. Uh, but but yeah, it can be a little taxing and a little confusing. But that so would have been a long day. To oh yeah, that. yeah. Well, and that's where you gotta you gotta reach out to your team, right, and try to help uh, discern some of that stuff. And there's of course some interesting in- information on the internet. But been to some of. So the, let, yeah, let's generalize yeah. though, John. Just, what are the what have been the the programs? For you, wildlife, yeah, yeah for recreational use most often. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So looking at wildlife cost share programs or recreational landowner type uh, programs, the most commonly used one is EQIP, and that's E-Q-I-P. There's no U in it, but it's, the acronym is for Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And uh, that program used to be what uh, we had a WIP, Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program. That program no longer exists, and now all that funding is under EQIP. And just some examples of some uh, some programs or some uh, practices, I'm sorry, practices that would be available to private landowners under EQIP would be uh, reforestation practices, prescribed burning, timber stand improvement are some examples. Also, we do a lot of, and I've used a lot of early successional habitat development. That can be things like killing fescue or non-native grasses and allowing early succession to, to come back can be a great deer management practice. Also, wetland habitat development for folks who want to either do bottomland hardwood reforestation or uh, manage shallow water areas. That's available under EQIP. We also use EQIP a lot for invasive species control. If you have kudzu or kogan grass on your property, invasive species control is a big practice. And they also uh, primarily, I would say, uh, statewide are using EQIP for erosion control. And that's going to be a problem, obviously, on recreational landowners and not just agricultural producers. Um, They can do bank stabilization practices. And then another practice you'll hear them talk about are gully plugs sometimes. And that's an interesting name for uh, putting up a levee uh, or a dike, but that is not intended to be a fish pond. Uh, Everybody asks me when we start talking about it, they call, I get called at least once in a while. Uh, saying, I, I need a fish pond. Won't y'all come build me a pond? I want a pond on this acreage. And they don't do that anymore. They used to build stock tanks uh, mm-hmm. for cattle landowners, and those mm-hmm. would be small ponds in some cases, but they will not do ponds for recreational use anymore. Well, John, let me ask you, when you say reforestation, that's going to offset the cost for the landowner to purchase seedlings? It, it, it's very good. There are actually a couple of practices that go into reforestation, so they can pay for seedlings uh, individually. They can pay for site preparation, which could include burning or herbicides. Um, and there are also f- uh, fire lane establishment. All those types of things could be under EQIP. Any aspect of reforestation can be paid for. Now, there are some sideboards to that, and that does not include things like establishing fruit orchards uh, or something like that. This is reforestation with the purpose of creating a new forest. Um, but c- could it be mixed pine hardwood, or does it have to be any specific species? There there are practice standards involved, and so you have to talk with that county office, and they're going to tell you a minimum number of trees per acre that you have to plant to get that reforestation cost share, and they have standards. But they do allow, uh, for instance, mixed pine hardwood, hardwood, pine. They will allow you in a hardwood planting to put soft mast, and they actually require you to put uh, soft mast trees in in some cases. What are the most common soft mast trees? The most common soft mast trees we see a lot of persimmon. uh, Well, some of it is limited by availability, uh, but we do see a fair bit of persimmon. People will put sugarberry. Uh, folks will use black cherry in some cases. It's hard to get seedlings, and black cherry doesn't do very well in our climate. Um, black tupelo or black gum, I've seen people plant mm-hmm. that. And then, of course, they'll use the hard mass trees, uh, the oaks and the hickory, well, pecan, oaks and pecan, uh, really yeah. commonly. And and how about for burning? How how is how are you reimbursed as a landowner for that? Sure. Well, they have a a scheduled cost share rate, so they they pay based on a per acre basis, and also they pay for fire lanes based on a per foot of fire lane. And I don't want to quote that uh, because that's not my program. I don't want to get mm-hmm. into the dollars and cents of it. But uh, but it's already set, so you can't uh, come in with a receipt that you got your cousin to come burn your back forty for two hundred thousand dollars and get fifty percent of that back. It's a set uh, rate. Not that anybody would do that. No, uh, no, 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 no. no. Uh, but it's a set rate. Is that typically the rate for the area established by the State Forestry Commission? 
No, Bronson, they actually changed that. That used to be the case about maybe five or six years ago, but they went to zones, I guess, USDA did. And we're in a three-state cluster with Arkansas and Louisiana, and so we all kind of use the same cost share rate. And actually, I will be honest with you, the the, the rate is very good. It should mm -hmm. be able to um, account for any normal burning. Where you will run into issues is if you have a small acreage uh, because the contractors are going to, not be able to accommodate something like 10 acres at the per acre cost rate, they're going to have to charge a larger per acre rate to accommodate a small acreage or where we have highly volatile fuels near urban areas. That's going okay. to be a different rate. But standard burning shouldn't be a problem with the cost share rates that they currently have. Now, I will tell you this is uh, EQIP is uh, a limited funding program. I mean, it just is what it is. There's only so much so much funding out there. And if you're interested in any of the practices we just talked about, you can apply at your USDA service center. Usually, it's a good idea to get applications in in the fall, in the summer or fall, and they usually will rank them sometimes in the fall, but they'll be done with ranking by January for sure. And so you need to make sure that you get your application on file uh, prior to the fall. Let's say that. And, John, it's just literally they're going to go go until the money runs out, essentially, allocated well, for that county or that region? It's a or? slight bit more complicated than that. They have to rank uh, based on resource priorities. They will rank practices, and there's a county committee involved, a local working group. It's a little mm -hmm. bit complicated, but there are some checks and balances, and uh, we've been able to get wildlife practices, and they're required to fund, uh, use up roughly 5% of the funding statewide on wildlife practices. So we've been able to get a few in. Uh, some of the agricultural practices, which are arguably uh, more important in some cases, I mean, certainly erosion issues that have multiple resource concerns, uh, nutrient issues that have multiple resource concerns, I certainly want those practices to be a high priority. And those do tend to get funding perhaps more often than some of the wildlife practices. And they're very expensive practices in some cases, but arguably for the greater good, for the greater population, they're, they're really important. So. The, the next acronym, John, is probably the one people have heard the most, CRP. CRP. Yeah, we can't get out of any discussion of Farm Bill programs without uh, at least touching on CRP. Now, right now, and that CRP stands for the Conservation Reserve Program. It was one of the earlier Farm Bill programs, and it was in, originally intended to take land highly erodible land out of production, and it did a great job at it. So in Mississippi, we actually have uh, more uh, CRP contracts than pretty much any state, and specifically more forest land uh, CRP contracts. But CRP basically pays a, land to take a la uh, pays a landowner to take land out of agricultural production, and they also are getting an annual rental rate. It pays for the establishment of the cover, and they get an annual rental rate. So it's a pretty good deal. However, they're not taking uh, any CRP enrollment right now. It's currently shut down. That The program has a nationwide cap that they are very close to reaching. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that, and I don't know that we want to get too deep into CRP, except I do want people to know if you buy a new property, you need to go to the USDA office and see if there are any contracts currently on the property so you can get the rental rate changed into your name, most importantly, I suppose. But secondarily, you want to make sure that you don't violate that CRP contract. You don't want to go in and clear a bunch of land that's bound in a contract and be liable for that. And then the most important thing in my mind as a wildlife biologist is you want to see if you're eligible for mid-contract management on your CRP. I think that's one of the most underutilized programs in our state, certainly, where we have so much CRP. So give, give some examples of that. What yeah, would be a so, mid-contract? Yeah, CRP mid-contract management. All that means is if you're in the middle of, for instance, a 10-year contract, any time in the first seven years of your contract, as long as it is in your conservation plan, and that plan can be modified, you can conduct and be compensated, be cost-shared for uh, certain practices. An example of a practice there would be prescribed burning or herbicide spray and brush control, for instance, under a pine plantation. You could do the whole QVM thing. That's actually its own practice. Quality vegetation management. I was going to ask you yeah. to define that acronym. Yeah, quality, quality vegetation, vegetation management. management. It's, it's its own practice in our state. Uh, has its own practice standard. And so you just have to see if uh, where you are in your CRP contract, if that is a, a practice that you need on your property, you need to see if you can get your, your conservation plan modified and see if that's still available. And you would talk, for CRP, it's actually administered by the Farm Service Agency 
although the technical guidance is usually done by the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Okay, what about uh, WRE? Yeah, that's a good question, Bronson. WRE is also another really popular program. WRE stands for the Wetland Reserve Easements or Wetland Reserve Easement I guess program they, they they took the P off the end. Uh, I'm, Most people are used to well, hearing WRP. WRP, and yeah. that's the one that it was. It, it was that for a very long wetland reserve program. When they redid the last farm bill five years ago, when they uh, when they re-upped it, they eliminated WRP and they changed it to WRE and put it underneath a whole bunch of other easement programs. It was basically an administrative. Uh, process and I don't want to go into all that but what WRE is is an easement program so if you have land that's eligible for WRE pretty much has to be agricultural land um, they will compensate the landowner through an easement and we'll talk about easements very last in this whole deal but uh, basically you're allowing the the land to be taken out of production and they have a 30-year option for easements or perpetual easement and you're compensated for the for the value of that easement uh, for surrendering the property rights on the value of that easement. And uh, you're also going to get some cost share in establishing the permanent cover. And in WRE, that's going to usually be bottomland hardwoods and also shallow water areas for waterfowl. What, what's the, the reimbursement rate? What is that based on? Uh, yeah, is that on the, the, the well, production they have what's that called, that piece yeah, of land was, was utilized for? Well, there is a statewide – it depends on how – what is in – they have a separate rate for uh, row crop agriculture and pasture, and it depends. It is a statewide rate, and again, remember, we're in that kind of cluster with Arkansas and Louisiana, but they uh, they call it the GARC rate, and I cannot for the life of me remember what that, st- that acronym stands for, but uh, I would encourage you to talk with NRCS and see what your GARC rate, you, which, which rate you would be eligible for, and I, I certainly don't want to speak out of turn there. What about, um, <laughs> I think this is one of those things we joke about, can you, uh, can you for the, the sole purpose of making a duck hole, yeah. can you use WRE for that? Yeah, well, maybe in the past some folks perhaps have done that, but if you look at the goals of the program, it is a wetland restoration program. So they're going to restore the function and, and hydrology of a wetland, and in some cases that does include making some really good duck holes, and I have seen some really good duck holes produced from WRP. But the problem comes when people think about uh, a quote-unquote duck hole. They want to plant corn in it, and they want to uh, manipulate the uh, yeah, water. Manipulate yeah, manipulate the water. Well, you can manipulate the water, certainly, and you're actually encouraged and required to manipulate the water. But you have to remember that the number one goal of the program is not necessarily making a uh, jam-up duck hole with uh, with planted corn and 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 brown top millet and all those different things and you having a a snazzy duck blind and all that those are those are things that they're they're are really not flexible in this program there's can cannot be any cultivation uh, of any of those holes so just be aware you know Mm -hmm. there are some great things wre is a great program particularly when you think about the perpetual easement part of it the fact that we're making habitat not just for waterfowl and wetland animals but for white-tailed deer making habitat in in my delta that eventually will hopefully end up being wild turkeys you know we're looking at some of that right now uh and also for non-game animals like some of the migratory birds and wild pigs and wild pigs oh you had to go there. <laughs> unfortunately you had to go there <laughs> sorry about that so moving on from the farm bill and i and i'm going to leave the farm bill because a lot of uh thing is still a lot of things are still in flux with the farm bill so i don't Mm -hmm. want to you know waste any time we've already gone kind of long but uh but basically uh there are some other options for folks for cost share other than farm bill and in many cases i would go the other route before i would go the farm bill so uh many state forestry agencies uh have cost share programs for reforestation and in mississippi we have the forest resource development program or frd and that comes from the a severance tax that's levied on timber sales and uh, that money is put back into through the state forestry commission put back into private landowners for reforestation practices uh, you have a minimum of 10 acres you have to have a minimum of 10 acres of forest land to be eligible for frdp and they go up to seven thousand dollars total expenditure per landowner and that's over the life of that landowner not uh seven thousand in one year 
So uh, they can also cover reforestation, site preparation, prescribed burning, timber stand improvements, so competition control. They can do release with it. Pretty much anything that has to do with forest management or forestry, uh, our State Forestry Commission can help folks. So I'm curious about something you said. It's got to be forest to land. Well, it can be forest land or the restoration of forest okay. land. So you can go into pasture land, for instance, and reforest pasture land, but okay. it's got to be with a uh, a forestry motive, let's say. Gotcha, um, gotcha. The other program that I've been able to use a lot and, and had good luck with in North Mississippi particularly uh, is their hazard mitigation burning program. So you can talk to your state forestry uh, department. That's through the USDA Forest Service. If you're property has uh, I believe it's 10 911 addresses within a certain buffer uh, hmm. then you could be eligible for hazard mitigation is to try to get fire into areas so they don't have wildfires and such as that and that's a very good program uh, cost share type program they also have fuel reduction burning if you're in the forest near any forest service land you might be eligible for a fuel reduction burning and then state forestry also has uh, their own Kogan grass control program so you can contact State Forestry, the Mississippi Forestry Commission, uh, about those programs. And again, John, just for everyone's benefit, this is a reimbursement. This isn't someone coming and doing it for you. It's a reimbursement? Well, it depends on the program, Bronson. Actually, the hazard mitigation burning and the, uh, and the fuel reduction burning is going to be a situation where the Forestry Commission actually conducts that that burn. Okay. They're, they're compensated. The Forestry Commission is compensated by the USDA Forest Service. But that's a competitive entry uh, type program. It's going to be more of a first come, first serve type program. And they do have annual limits on how much funding is available on that. Okay. So, uh, Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, another group that has cost share programs potentially is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, uh, the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program is really what they've got left now. And uh, unfortunately, that's gone more towards endangered species, or fortunately for the endangered species. Mm-hmm. But right. if you're listening to this from a uh, deer management standpoint, that's going to whittle it down quite a lot. And of course, if there's limited funding, they have to prioritize. So uh, we don't want to be too negative there. But basically, uh, it's going to be improvements to waterways where endangered species are present and we've also been able to fund quite a bit of prescribed burning uh, particularly down in the range of the gopher tortoise in the longleaf area uh, with federal funds there i remember you and scott edwards first talking about fire on the 40 oh yeah it's and fire a on good the program 40 is a, a really neat example of a program where the state went in and created so to speak uh, a program and not I don't, it wasn't just mdwfmp it was actually uh, numerous partners particularly the fish and wildlife service and uh, we basically went objective driven with it if you will uh, and said we want to just focus on prescribed burning prescribed burning only and as a matter of fact we had kind of a, a, a flexible pot of money that we wrote grants for and so it's come from a bunch of different avenues and we've just been able to be very flexible with that for the landowners um, and also focus that uh, funding just on prescribed fire uh, but we'll see how that goes. Well, John, it sounds like the uh, the cost share is going to come and go, and it, it, it will forever and ever for the rest of our lives. It's going to sure. be in flux all the time. I remember you saying, though, at the beginning of our, our conversation, you talked about depending on whether someone uh, had income or a lot of income, that sometimes it's they're better off rather than going cost share more with tax savings that's a that's a really good point bronson uh for folks that are that are high earners they already have a pretty high tax burden and actually when you get cost share payments they send you a 1098 it's considered as income you have to declare it so in some cases it's adding to an already high tax burden for some landowners uh one of the things we look at for the high earners for the folks that have a high tax burden we look at tax relief uh and tax credits And this is where if you thought the TLAs, the three-letter acronyms, were complicated, you start talking about tax tax credits and tax relief. Um, You're getting into code section and all that. It's pretty tough. But uh, I I would encourage anyone, and and certainly most of these these types of landowners that are going to be interested in tax credit are already working with a good CPA. Uh, But I would encourage you to really... uh, you know, talk to your CPA and evaluate and make sure they know about land management. They know about some of the farm credits uh, that folks are dealing with and some of the ways to 
uh, declare farm revenue and those types of things. And then also you really need to get to if you have a forested property with a registered forester. And I'll get to that in a minute as to why it's important to involve a registered forester. Probably the worst thing that happens when I get out onto a, a landowner, a new piece of land, let's say somebody's just purchased a piece of land, uh, one of the first things that I'll ask them is, did you did you get a timber appraisal? And they always say, well, yeah, yeah, we got an appraisal when we, you know, got the loan. And I say, no, 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 you got a property appraisal. Did you get the timber appraised separately of the property? And uh, that's that's critical for establishing what's called basis. And I would encourage anyone to go on the website and look up basis. That There's some good resources for that. Uh, TimberTax.org. That's all one word, TimberTax.org. Very good website for all things related to tax and timber tax especially. So why is that a big deal, John? Yeah, well, basis is a big deal because when you buy a property new, you're not, uh, you're not the one who, for instance, had all that timber that's growing on it at that per- current time. The landowner prior to you probably established that timber. And so if you go in and cut that timber... Uh, for instance, some folks will try to cut timber to try to pay down the note right when they buy a tract of land. You just bought that timber. You haven't had any appreciation of it, so you shouldn't pay capital gains on the entirety of uh, of the, the revenue that you get back from that timber cut. So you've got to establish your basis to establish what you're responsible for for just the appreciation on that timber in terms of capital gains, and that, that can be really important. Also, we have a lot of tornadoes in Mississippi. I can tell you I live in northeast Mississippi, and uh, in the springtime we don't go very very long without having to get in the bathtub and uh, you know listen to the radio and whatnot. And uh, if those tornadoes come through and, and wipe out a big tract of timber, uh, you are eligible to declare a lot of that for casualty loss. And that's that's a bad situation. There's no good that can come out of it. But if you don't have your basis established, it's going to be even worse uh, because you won't be able to. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, a lot of times we can do salvage operations, but even the difference in the salvage is going to be less than it would have been. So uh, if you work with a registered forester, and, and a registered forester has to be involved in that process in establishing a basis. Uh, another example of a tax credit or a tax program would be the state reforestation tax credit. And in Mississippi, that's uh, up to 50% of the cost of reforestation. And you can amortize that or spread it out over a couple of years. There's also a federal reforestation tax credit. And I'm not sure the exact details of that federal credit. That does change from year to year. Um, and so you've got to look work with your CPA on that. Um, you would not be eligible for those credits if you've got any kind of a cost share. You know, it's one or the other, either the cost share or the tax credits. Um, but if you have a high uh, tax burden, you know, that tax credit may be to a, a bigger benefit. Also, if you've set your property up as a farm, you may be eligible to uh, to expense some of the maintenance activities. For instance, uh, maintaining the fire breaks of the property. Uh, maintenance activities like uh, we've even made the case of controlling invasive species uh, could be considered maintenance expenses and may be able to be uh, expensed on your taxes. Also, you may be able to depreciate your equipment if you can establish yourself as a tree farm and you need to talk to a registered forester and your CPA about how to establish your property as a tree farm. It doesn't have to be a tree farm. That's a that's a type of uh, certification, tree farm certification. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about, although that's a good program. Um, but you, you need to work with the CPA and Forrester to get the details right on all of that. And then the very last thing we'll close with, I suppose, are, are conservation easements. That's probably a, an underutilized tool uh, in Mississippi. They're really picking up a lot of uh, interest in easements in the northeast and other areas where you've got rapid urban sprawl. So a conservation easement is basically transferring some of the rights, some of your rights as a landowner, uh, to a third party, and most of the time that's a nonprofit group. And when I say transferring your rights, that sounds scary to a lot of people, but you might just be giving up the right, for instance, to develop the property, to make a subdivision uh, or a Walmart or something on, on that piece of property. And most of the easements that I've seen, they actually have allowances for structures. So if my, me, myself or my descendants, for instance, want to build a, a house or a lodge on this place, we might line out an area of the easement that would be eligible for me and my descendants to ever build a structure. Um, you're not necessarily giving up 
all rights for development in most of these cases. And we talked about WRE earlier. You know, there are some rights you're giving up there. You're not going to farm the property. You're not going to develop it. But you don't give up the right, for instance, with WRE to subdivide it. So you can uh, uh, divide that property. And, of course, you don't give up the rights to hunt. So uh, those are just some examples. But easements can be a very, very useful tool. And I find them to be particularly useful, obviously, for folks who have those family estates like we talked about earlier. And also your high earners, folks that need some type of tax relief. Also, if you're a a property or a landowner that has a a very valuable property, let's say you acquired a family land, a piece of family land, and over the course of your lifetime, it's appreciated considerably in value, and you're worried about the estate tax or some uh, aspect of of transferring your estate to the next generation. That conservation easement is going to be very useful there. Uh, One of the big problems we have as wildlife biologists is the the whittling down of these tracks. You know, when when tracks change hands and there's a big estate tax, um, you know, the back 40 gets sold to pay off uh, for the the taxes on the the front. The front 40. Yeah, the front 40, (laughs) exactly. And so that happens a couple of times. You look down the road, it's not going to be very long before your average track size gets smaller and smaller. And then we start to be more fragmented in the landscape, and that affects a lot of things. So uh, conservation easements are really our best tool and probably our only tool. What's the typical acreage? Uh, this is you know, a wide-open question, but <laughs> acreage-wise, can this be as small as what and as large as what? Uh, we've, I've seen them as small as five acres. There was one particular easement that was protecting a, a, a significant uh, cultural resource, for instance. Let's say we've got... Um, uh, I've seen them put in, I'm trying to think, the the Civil War area, I guess a significant Civil War area was Mm -hmm. very small. Um, And then also there will be some uh, conducted over significant ecological areas that are very small. But for the most part, these are usually pretty large tracts of land. Now, I've seen them, you know, I I couldn't tell you at all what the average tract size would be. Uh, I've seen them in that 100, 180 acre range, and I've seen several that were in the 3,000 and even one that I know of that was 20 uh, like 21,000 acre conservation easement. So, uh, and, you, and you're compensated as a landowner through tax relief, I suppose, uh, <laughs> compensated as the landowner for that, those rights that you're giving up. So the alternate, I, I don't want to say the alternate rate of return, that's the in, improper terminology, but uh, you're compensated for the difference in what that property could have been valued at uh, when you had the full rights. Well, John, um, this is why I'm glad I know you. <laughs> It's because when we go through, we've spent the last uh, 45 minutes or so. There are so many details. It's uh, for me when you know my my uh, I'm not involved in it at the level you are, and so it it uh, it gets confusing for me certainly. Sure. And so I'm I'm glad there's people like you and our buddy Kevin Nelms within RCS. Oh, yeah. We I, visit I, with him a lot about this. Had to name drop Kevin. Had to bring <laughs> exactly. Him into this. Exactly. It, it gets even more confusing, Bronson, when you start to think about the fluctuations in the markets, the commodities markets. Oh, timbers up, timbers down. Cows are up, cows are down. Yeah. I think uh, for some folks that are listening to this, if you made it all the way to the end. Uh, This thing's complicated, man. It's very complicated. Uh, Don't mean to be intimidating to folks. There's help out there for you. Um, We're we're here, uh, the private lands biologist in whatever state you're listening from, and certainly in Mississippi, we would encourage you to go to our website, uh, mdwfp.com slash private lands, and try to get with one of our private lands biologists, or, uh, or certainly you can talk to USDA or the... Uh, Mississippi Forestry Commission, great resources for any of this type of stuff. Also, we've got some nonprofits that work a lot in Mississippi. The National Wild Turkey Federation has been heavily involved in a lot of farm bill programs. Also, uh, Wildlife Mississippi and Delta Wildlife are two very active uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that have been working on farm bill programs for way longer uh, than myself. So uh, there's some great, great sources uh, of information out there. And I, th- I think you gave a great recommendation uh, initially, and that was assembling your technical team. That's right. Starting at the county level and maybe move up from that, but go into your your county USDA service center, sure. go into a cooperative extension, and a lot of times they're housed together as I, well. I, so I, I can they, think of most of the counties, and certainly in the central part of the state in the northeast that I'm familiar with, the extension and, and NRCS are going to be in the same yeah. building. 
Yep. So, well, good. thanks a bunch, John. Appreciate you taking time away. Time away from what? What are you doing right now? Uh, well, this is actually our busy time of year. May is uh, post-turkey season site visits. We'll say that. Uh, okay. When people are done turkey hunting, we're doing a lot of site visits right now, and we're also pr- uh, writing DMAP reports. So, what, What's the D in DMAP for? Deer. Deer management. Yeah. Got me. Deer management. Hey, I worked in a quail reference, though. You sure did. I did. You forget that I can edit it out, though. Oh. Yeah. All right, John. Thanks a bunch. We're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management. If you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service, and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education.